everybody. Welcome to the September 17th, 2024 City of Oshkosh Planning Commission meeting. We are glad you can join us. I see we have a quorum now. I have a few <coughs> housekeeping items to go over before we begin. Please turn off or silence all personal communication devices. The applicant and members of the public may speak to any item before the plan commission when the relevant item to which you wish to speak is called and public comment is opened. And unless an exception is made by the plan commission, the following rules will apply. The applicant will be given up to 10 minutes to present any information they wish for us to consider. Thereafter, members of the public will be given up to five minutes to address a specific item before the plan commission. Members of the public may only speak once per called agenda item unless a plan commission member requires clarification or wishes to ask you a question. Questions or statements from the audience will not be considered. Only statements from the podium after your stated name and address and within the allowed time constraints will be considered. After all community members have had an opportunity to speak on the called agenda item, the applicant will be asked if they have a final statement for the plan commission and then the commission may, ta may take action on that agenda item. The Common Council has adopted rules of decorum for city boards and commissions, including the adoption of a civility pledge. No person shall personally attack a board or commission member, city official, staff, or any other person. No person shall make irrelevant, unduly repetitive, offensive, threatening, slanderous, defamatory, or obscene remarks, or act in such a manner as to disrupt the disorderly order of the meeting. This includes hand clapping, stomping of feet, whistling, shouting, or other demonstrations. I do appreciate your understanding. Uh, now on to the agenda. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Balco? Here. Ms. Davey? Here. Mr. Lowenstein? Mr. Bowen? Here. Ms. Shireman? Ms. Prop? Here. Councilmember Nichols? Vice Chair Kiefer? And Chairman Perry? Here five board members present. Thank you. Uh, approval of the September 3rd, 2024 minutes. Move to approve as written. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Okay, I'm seeing none. We can have a voice vault. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the minutes carry. Item number one on the agenda is a general development plan for a multifamily development at Zero Bowen <coughs> Street, commonly known as vacant property located near the southwest corner of East Murdoch Avenue and Bowen Street. Thomas Roosh is the owner, Mach 4 Engineering and Surveying LLC is the applicant. If there have been any site inspections by the Plan Commission? Okay, that is so noted. I will accept the staff report as part of the record, so please present your summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The applicant requests approval of a general development plan for a multifamily development. Um, the subject site consists of a 2.26 acre vacant lot on the southwest corner of East Murdoch and Bowen Street. The site is zoned urban mixed use with a plan development overlay. The surrounding areas consist of industrial uses to the north, commercial and institutional uses to the east, commercial uses to the west, as well as vacant to the south. The 2040 comprehensive land use plan recommends neighborhood commercial for the subject area. A plan commission workshop was held April 16th of this year and plan commission was supportive of this proposal. The applicant is proposing a development which will include two 18 unit apartment buildings and one 16 unit apartment building with detached garages. Um, the proposed 32 units result in a density of 14.2 units per acre, which meets the maximum density for apartment buildings in the UMU district. The minimum lot area is 1,200 square feet per dwelling unit, and the applicant is proposing 3,049 square feet per dwelling unit, which exceeds the necessary requirement. The UMU district allows apartments of 3 to 12 units per building. Apartments 13, and six, 13 to 16 units are allowed as a conditional use. Staff does not have any concerns with the proposed 16 unit building as the site will remain under the maximum density and is not adjacent to a lower intensity land use. A neighborhood meeting was held on September 9th, 2024 and neighborhoods, neighbors in attendance voiced questions and concerns relating to surrounding land uses, traffic and recreation areas. The proposed site will utilize the existing driveway 
access on East Murdoch Avenue and Bowen Street. A cross access agreement will need to be registered with the Winnebago County Register of Deeds to allow those shared accesses. The applicant <coughs> is providing 32 parking spaces and 36 driveway spaces to meet the par parking requirement of one space per dwelling unit. The applicant is also requesting a BSM to allow a reduced rear setback to 18.7 feet where code allows a minimum of 25 feet. Staffers, staff is supportive of this BSM be request as the rear property line is adjacent to the existing, to an existing parking lot in Access Drive. Um, code requires a recreation area for multifamily developments at a minimum of 200 square feet plus 25 square feet per bedroom um, for a total of 1,800 square feet of recreation area. The applicant is proposing a recreation area of 2,100 square feet, which exceeds the necessary requirement. That's located right here. Um, and that, so according to the conceptual landscape plan, all requirements are being met. However, the provided street frontage landscaping calculations do not specify, specify points for the individual street frontages. This will be addressed during SIP. Um, also, the provided yard landscaping points exceed the total requirement. Additional yard landscaping serves to off offset the requested BSM for the reduced rear yard setback. Um, all site lighting and building facades will be addressed during CIP and site plan review. Um, staff recommends approval of the general development plan with the findings and conditions listed within the staff report. Okay, thank you. Uh, plan Commission, are there any technical questions to the staff? Any technical questions to the staff? Okay, I'm seeing none. This, I will open a public comment. We'll have public comment. I'll open a public comment period. Is the applicant here and do they wish to make a statement? I do not see the applicant. Okay. Um, the applicant is not here. So any other members of the public wish to speak on this agenda item? Are there any members of the public that wish to speak on this agenda item? All right, I'm seeing none, so I'm going to close the public comment period. We don't need a closing statement from the applicant, so plan commission, the action is upon you. Motion to adopt the findings and recommendation as stated in the staff report. Second. second. Oh, wake up. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Ms. Prop. Yeah, I'm sorry that the applicant is not here because I have a major issue. First of all, not with the land use. I think this is a wonderful development for that that area. This is my my neighborhood. I know it well. And my problem is the driveways. The driveway access that's already there for Piggly Wiggly on the north and on the south. And those are fine driveways except that they're not. They they lack adequate base. And they don't even, Murray can attest to this, they don't even stand up to grocery store traffic. Uh, in the spring, you'll, you'll see the big uh, patch, you'll see the patches in the driveways. That's where giant potholes appear every spring in the driveway because the driveway is not adequate to meet the needs. And so I, I believe that when, when they bring back a specific plan they need to come up with a, uh, a scheme to redo the uh, re improve the driveways and I know those are grocery store driveways that they don't want to have to improve but somebody needs to it will not be able to withstand the uh, apartment traffic okay thank you mr. Bowen um, this maybe was a technical question but I'm gonna ask Mark a question anyway in a non-technical way, um, the the 
procedurally, the difference between the general development plan approval and the specific implementation plan approval. The, the general development plan, if we approve this as it sits, approves the form and placement <coughs> generally of these items on the site, correct? Correct. <coughs> General locations, concept layout, if something significant would change in a layout, they would have to amend the GDP when they came back for SIP. This is really locking in that base land use of saying, yes, 32 units of apartments and an 18 and a half foot, 18.7 foot setback <coughs> on the west is okay. Uh, but it doesn't mean they couldn't seek to amend it if a building moved or something or had to be changed. They could ask to amend it during the SIP, and then it would be a, a, the full review. Uh, but this really, GDP is designed as an approval for concept layout and then really locking in that land use of, yes, we're good with this apartments on this site. So that, that's where I struggle, I think, a little bit with this one because I have no problem with the underlying land use. I, I like, if there was like a, a general, general development plan approval where we could approve the concept of putting 32 apartment units on this site and doing that, there are just some things on this site plan that I, they feel like sort of afterthoughts placed on a drawing to meet certain aspects of the code. I don't know that that recreation area makes sense to be was that five feet from the road? I mean, like that's, I, I don't know what's gonna be there, right? But like, it just sort of seems shoehorned in there. I think Kathy's right about the driveways and this is an overall development that is gonna function in concert with, um, you know, Murdoch and Bowen Street and those driveways and the aprons to those driveways that are gonna serve this development. I, there's, it, it meets 90, Five percent of the requirements in sort of technicality here, but I don't look at this site plan and think, "Boy, that's a really good site plan." It so I don't, I don't know that I'm okay approving it, even though I am okay approving sort of the, like you said, the general concept of 32 apartment units, setback, all that sort of stuff. So, so I don't know. There's an opportunity here for planning commission. You, you have some options. Ultimately, you could say, "Hey." In the exact form we have concerns with, we want to table it and have them be addressed prior to the GDP moving forward. You could also condition it on things you have concerns with if you're inclined to send it forward. We don't like the recreational space there. I look at this site plan, plenty of places to put it. Doesn't have to go there. There is more than enough other locations where they could meet their recreational space needs. The driveways, I think, is Kathy Rock. Like there are things I think you could add conditions onto the GDP that they need to then address during SIP. So you, you, you could go about it either way. You could simply want it fixed and now, table it, that feedback is given to the applicant, say, you know, you need to address these before planning commission will reconsider it. You could also say, condition it moving forward and then look for them to address it during SIP. I, I, this feels to me like the perfect opportunity, the reason that we have workshops. This yes. feels like it should have been workshopped. It was. We did, did workshop it. Oh, did I? I'm sorry, then I missed it. It wasn't workshop. It wasn't in workshop. My like, memory, like this. We didn't see like where things are going or anything. Right. Like, we no, we didn't see like, the layout. They just said this land here is going to have apartments. It, it had a very concept, even more conceptual than oh, this okay. layout on it at that time. Okay. Got it. Okay. That was back in I believe April. Okay. And I my head. Okay, Miss Prop. Well, I'm wondering if we should table it or ask for another workshop or something because it's quite disappointing that the developer or his representative is not here with with, with these serious questions if mr. Bowen if, if we make a motion to table the discussion here will get fed back to them I'm assuming we'll slow the minutes staff will be able to, to yeah. update the applicant on the, the concerns we've heard okay. today so I will, when it's appropriate, make a motion to table, um, but I don't want to cut off discussion. If no. there's, if there's other, uh, other concerns that should be read into the record to feed back to, um, feed back to the uh, developer. I think I got most of mine out. <laughs> hey, is there any other discussion on the motion? 
Ms. Davey. I'm having the same concerns plus a little. Um, I agree that it's not a good place for a I, I go through this intersection probably 10 times a day. I'm quite familiar with it. That is, I don't feel a very safe place to have your recreation space. Not that it's going to matter because every side of this is going to have roads on it. Um, my, I also have concerns where their driveways are coming in and out into the, I, I, I don't really know where I would say to put them, but and maybe maybe this is wider and bigger than I think it is, but it just feels to me like it's going to cause a lot of grief, especially during busy shopping times, you know, where people are in and out of there a lot. And as Kathy mentioned, the blacktop road that's there now, which I realize is outside of this, hmm. but it not only can't, they won't even get this thing built without that road just falling right down. I mean, the potholes can swallow a small car as it is. So we drive very carefully through there. It's, you get a path, you know. <laughs> so I have many concerns about that and I think that some of these questions do need to be addressed before I'm willing to discuss it more either. So I will definitely support tabling it. Any other discussion on the motion? Hey, I see now procedurally we have a motion do we formally have a motion yet I think we have a we have a motion, we have a motion in a second, in a second. So, so we have to we vote on that or we can table you can withdraw the motion on the floor I move to withdraw the motion I made whoever seconded it I accept or whoever did you <laughs> okay so we have a motion to withdraw and well, a no, now we need a motion to withdraw that was the original motion to get it on discussion uh, I will make a motion to table to the October next meeting first 15, there is no October 15, 12 15. we're skipping a meeting in there that is Planning Commission's discretion at this point there was not slated to be an October 1st meeting due to no agenda items you could choose to move this to October 1st and then there would be a meeting or you could choose to move this to October 15th so please state when you would like this to be tabled I'll until I want the representative here or whatever meeting. Yeah, and I think if we can give them as much lead time as possible that they need to be here, I think October 15th would be the would be the meeting to do it. Too. So I, I'll, I will make a motion to table uh, this item to the October 15th plan commission meeting. I will second that. Can we have a motion to table to October 17th? 15th. 15th. And we have a second. Any discussion on this motion? I am seeing none. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Balba? Aye. Ms. Davey? Aye. Mr. Lowenstein? Aye. Mr. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Prone? Aye. Chairman Perry? No. Motion to table to October 15 carried 5 1. Thank you. Item number two, specific implementation plan for phase two of a commercial development <coughs> west of and adjacent to 1710 Oshkosh Avenue. Lakeshore Development of Oshkosh LLC is the owner and applicant. Have there been any site inspections by the plan commission? Okay, those are so noted. I will accept the staff report as part of the record. Please present your summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The subject, subject site is a 1.33 acre uh, partially developed parcel at the northwest corner of Oshkosh Avenue and Northwest Field Street. The property is zoned corporate business park with a planned development overlay and the surrounding area consists of commercial uses to the east and west, a hotel to the north and residential uses to the south. Uh, this will be the fifth time this property has come before this body, last time being in May of 2023 for a GDP and SIP. Uh, approval for Mr. Brew's Tap House uh, restaurant development located on the property. The applicant's proposing the second of a two phase development. Uh, phase now, uh, phase one was the now completed uh, 4,200 square foot single story restaurant and sports bar, which is Mr. Brew's Tap House, located uh, right at the corner of Westfield and Oshkosh Avenue. And phase two is proposed to be a 4,479 square foot commercial mm -hmm. building, 
proposed to be Golden Nest Pancakes and Cafe with a 308 square foot outdoor patio. It's just a uh, air photo, it doesn't even show Mr. Bruce, but anyways, here's the site plan. The area in red is the proposed building addition. Uh, the development will have a single access from the existing shared access drive um, across from Northwest Field Street, which is right up here. A cross access agreement has been recorded within Winnebago County Regist Register of Deeds as part of the phase one of this development. The applicant is requesting a base standard modification to allow 71 parking spaces for both phases where a maximum of 42 spaces are allowed. According to the applicant, the increased parking is needed as the maximum capacity of the sports bar is up to 150 people. Uh, the applicant is trying to get closer to uh, 71 stalls, which is closer to one space per two people at maximum capacity, capacity which was approved uh, with the phase one approval. Staff is supported, supportive of the BSM. Uh, for increased parking as dine-in restaurants may need more parking than code currently allows and this request is not uh, dissimilar from other restaurant developments requesting BSMs for increased parking. <coughs> a dumpster enclosure was constructed as part of, part of phase one at the northwest corner of the site. It was sized uh, appropriately to accommodate both restaurants. The development is meeting all building and parking setbacks as required by the CBP district. There was a base standard modification approved with the phase one SIP for reduced, uh, reduced yard setback from five, uh, to five feet from the code required of requirement of 25 feet. This <coughs> development will not be encroaching anymore within that setback. Uh, stormwater utilities were constructed with the phase one development. The facilities were designed and constructed to accommodate both phases one and two. The Department of Public Works reviewed phase two development and reported that no changes should be needed and this will be confirmed during site plan review. Okay, this is the landscaping plan. All the landscaping in the, uh, the unshaded area has been installed to date. The area in red is the proposed new landscaping for phase two. Um, as far as the building foundation, the landscape plan shows a combination of shrubs um, only along the building's south elevation adjacent to where the proposed patio will be and uh, no foundation plantings along the west or entrance elevation and the north ele elevation. The, uh, the applicant is also deficient with the total point requirement of 40 points per 100 linear feet of building foundations which equates to 180.4 points required and 172.6 points being provided. Um, when you look at the Mr. Bruce development, there is substantial foundation plantings all the way around and staff would not be supportive of a BSM to omit the plantings along these two facades. So the city staff will work with the developer uh, during site plan review to have this addressed. Uh, the paved area landscaping does meet the re, uh, required requirement of 50 points uh, per 10 parking stalls. As proposed, uh, 470.5 points are being proposed where 355 points are required, which is 132% over the minimum required. Uh, similar, similarly, street frontage, they're proposing approximately 106% of points that are needed and 120 uh, points uh, beyond what's required for yard landscaping. Uh, signage. Uh, the applicant has not submitted site, uh, sign plans. However, the elevation plans show proposed wall signage in the form of channel letters illuminated by gooseneck lamps on the South, F, uh, the South Oshkosh Avenue facing facade and the West Elevation. The signs are proposed to be 18 square feet in area with the maximum with maximum being one square foot per linear, linear foot of building frontage. Um, phase one of this development included a retail monument, monument sign, uh, nine foot eight inches tall, uh, with three 20 square foot sign panels along, along the corner of Oshkosh Avenue and Northwest Field Street. Uh, it is, you know, it's been constructed and does meet the code requirements of the 
uh, CBP uh, zone district. This is the photo photometric plan that was submitted. Uh, the light or the light plan meets minimum lighting level of 0.4 foot candles for all parking and drive areas. Lighting levels do not exceed the maximum of 0.5 foot candles at the east, south, and west property lines. On the southern image, this is the north side up here. Um, light levels do go up to 0 0.67 foot candles, which is which exceeds what code um, requires or uh, what code allows. But staff is recommending a BSM for the light level to exceed this maximum, as the increased lighting is will be illuminating uh, the main drive entrance and would not have any uh, detrimental effect on the neighboring property to the north. These are the building materials, the facades. Uh, the corporate business park standards required or require buildings to be clad on all sides with at least 75% class one materials. And also a window and door opening shall comprise of at least 40% of the ground floor <coughs> of the street facing facade. Uh, the elevations provided greatly exceed these requirements with 95.5% uh, class one materials on the north, 95.4 on the south. The east is abutting the Mr. Bruce building, so that's not applicable. And on the west side, they're proposing 95.6%. And the street facing side is um, showing to provide 40.4% of window and door area. <coughs> Overall, the applicant is requesting, requesting BSMs to increase the parking and the excessive lighting along the north property line. To offset these BSMs, the applicant will be exceeding the overall landscaping point requirement for the site and is proposing class one materials greatly exceeding the 75% minimum on all facades. So staff is comfortable with uh, that the applicant has adequately offset the requested BSMs and the oversight is complementary, complementary to the surrounding area. So staff is, oops, staff is supported, uh, supportive of the SIP plan for phase two of this development. Thank you for your report, Plan Commission. Are there any technical questions for staff? Any technical questions? Okay, I'm seeing none. We're gonna open, uh, we're gonna have public comment and I'm gonna open the public comment period. Is the applicant here and willing to give a statement? Mr. Hoopman, do you wanna give yeah, a statement? I'm available if there are questions, I don't really have a statement. Okay, is there any member of the public that wishes to speak on this agenda item? Any member of the public that wish to speak on this agenda item? Okay, I'm seeing none, so I'm gonna close the public comment period. And uh, we don't need a closing statement from the applicant, so commission, the action is upon you. Motion. Motion to adopt the findings and recommendation as stated in the staff report. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this motion? Ms. Pop. Just that this is a, a nice complimentary use there. Com uh, important for the two hotels and uh, neighbors, and I like it as a use. Mr. Bellwood. Um, I've actually been to the Golden Nest in Sun Prairie, and uh, I really think this is a great addition uh, for this location. Um, it has a, it had a really uh, diverse group of people there. Um, you had old people, you had families. Um, on the TV, they had uh, an old Price is Right going on. Um, oh, it was just a trendy place, and uh, when I was there, I told my wife, I said, I wish we had a place like this in Oshkosh, and I'm not kidding about that. So this is an amazing uh, place to have there, so we're grateful for that. <laughs> So any other discussion on the motion? Um, I would like to add that I have absolutely no problem with increasing the parking spaces to 71. I wish we could make it 171. If you've ever been there during the really busy times, um, you would think that 171 might not be enough. So that is something I'm very happy to see because uh, it can get pretty busy there. Mr. Bowen. I suppose that's a uh, way to mention what you guys I think said in your staff report is that there's some consideration uh, on the part of the city to looking at our parking codes and determining where our parking code works and where our parking code doesn't work because clearly 42 parking spaces allowed for this type of development 
we shouldn't have to do a BSM for this. So I know you guys are looking at it. I'm just going to grind this axe until you know it's sharp. So. As, as we've learned, not all restaurants and traffic no. generation are created exactly. equal. <laughs> and our code does not spread right. that hair. So. Yeah. So any other discussion on the motion? Okay, I'm seeing none, so let's have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Belfo? Aye. Ms. Davey? Aye. Mr. Lowenstein? Aye. Mr. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Prop? Aye. Chairman Perry? Aye. Motion carried 5 0. Wonderful, thank you. Item number three is a public hearing. <coughs> is a zone change from neighborhood mixed use district to neighborhood mixed use district with a planned development overlay? An approval of a general development plan and specific implementation plan for a mixed-use building at 1700 Oregon Street. Chris Morth is the owner. RH Design Build is the applicant. Have there been any site inspections of this property by the Planning Commission? Okay, those are so noted. Um, I will accept the staff report as part of our record. Please present your summary. Thank you, Chairman. So as stated, uh, the applicant requests a zone change from the existing neighborhood mixed use district to a neighborhood mixed use district with a plan development overlay to accompany a general development plan and specific implementation plan to allow for a mixed use building, specifically to allow for a ground floor residential unit uh, that exceeds 30% of the ground, the total ground floor area. <coughs> so the subject site is a 0.64 acre parcel with frontage on Oregon and West 17th. The site contains a parking lot, a 30 by 60 garage, and a roughly 7,000 square foot uh, commercial building that was previously used as a tavern with a banquet hall, uh, tavern formerly known as Whitsky's uh, Bar Food and Banquet Hall. And there was a, or there is a uh, existing apartment above the tavern. So in 2005, the, the banquet hall and the kitchen and storage and ADA bathrooms were added to the existing building. And in recent years, uh, apparently there's been some weather related damages which caused the building to be closed. The current owners have started making the necessary repairs to make it safe and usable again. And um, yeah, I'll get to, here's some aerial footage. If some of you are probably familiar with the site. The newer looking roof is the newer section from 2005 and the older part is from the existing bar and apartment. <clears throat> so the applicant is requesting the zone change as stated uh, again to allow for that first floor residential unit uh, or, Well to allow for the, the GDP which uh, will be needed in order to allow for the ground floor unit to exceed 30% of that total ground floor area So the applicant did submit uh, a general or conceptual plan to show you know what part of that banquet area banquet hall area will be converted to the residential area um, Staff is supportive of this because um, the, NM, the NMUPD zoning will be consistent uh, with the neighboring property that is to the east and the plan development over will also allow for changes and improvements which may have not otherwise occurred. The applicant uh, does plan to remodel the entire building to make it a functional tavern again and is proposing to convert as stated that existing banquet hall to the first floor apartment. Um, if approved, the, uh, the property will have two apartments, a tavern, and a bank, and the banquet hall will no longer exist. A neighborhood meeting was held on September 5th. Uh, three neighbors were in attendance and none of them had objections to the proposed project. So just to get into the details here with the calculations, uh, the new apartment is roughly 3,100, or sorry, 3,150 square feet in size and the total ground floor area is about 6,000 square feet. And so again, as stated, a BSM will be needed to allow that area to exceed that 30% um, allowment for ground floor residential area. <coughs> so with that, staff is supportive of the BSM request to allow for that, ex, uh, that ground floor area to exceed 30%. Mr. Okay, thank you. We have a comment from... Yeah, I think this is a great example of looking at ways to support more housing in the city in a non-traditional sense. Um, unfortunately, using the plan development is the way we have to do it today, but this could be another opportunity where we need to look at the code again and say, okay, how can we promote housing in some of these non-traditional you know, senses? When the code was written in 2017 and we capped ground floor residential at 30%, it made sense during that climate, but knowing the housing challenges we face now as a community like most, 
these are some of the things that we may want to look at changing in the code to make it easier to do and add housing units. Okay, is there any technical questions from the plan commission to the staff? Any technical questions? All right, um, this is a public hearing, so I'm going to open the public hearing and request a statement from the applicant. Is the applicant here? Yes. yes. If you could approach the podium and state your name and address for our records, we'd appreciate it. Susan Hirschberg, RH Design Build and Oshkosh. Um, just to kind of elaborate on what was said, the, the owner plans to occupy this housing so they would be essentially watching over the tavern and running it um, which obviously helps with the neighborhood um, it also decreases the amount of traffic by uh, eliminating the um, assembly space so I think it's a, a win for the area and if you don't mind, I don't know if the calculations were correct as far as the 3,150 square feet in comparison to 6,000. I don't know if you had the exact calculations or not. But I don't. Okay. I think we're close. <laughs> Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Prop has a question. Our questions for Certainly. Them. All right. I have a question. Or you may ask. Okay. Um, were you planning exterior improvements to the building? Well, basically, I think... Uh, hold on, hold on. We'll have to approach the podium. You can come on up. Name and address, if you don't mind. Yeah. Right. Chris Morth, uh, Oshkosh, 611 Oregon Street right now. So basically, our plans are to uh, <clears throat> you know, clean up the building, clean up the yard, uh, make it uh, a nice facility, internal and external. Um, we're not looking to have a bar that's, it's, uh, you know, a bunch of riff that was in it, like in the last handful of years, as I understand. We want to have a nice establishment. We don't plan on being, you know, staying open until wee hours of the night. We want to be closed by 10 or 11. Um, as far as aesthetics outside of the building, you know, we plan to uh, you know, make things nicer. We've got a new roof on the main building. We're going to put a, a roof on the back section, clean up the railings around it, replace the steps going up the back um, you know it's so really just freshen it up and get a uh, fresh coat of paint on what needs to have painted and and uh, make it look beautiful again okay. well my primary concern was the uh, paint needed on the turret or the tower whatever you call it that just glared out at me when I drove by oh, oh yeah but yeah, the rest of the <laughs> exterior it looked pretty decent but yeah please if you paint that I will be happy Absolutely. It's just, I mean, we want to have a, a beautiful building, and uh, you know, there's a lot of history with that particular building. So uh, it's our our motive to make it look as uh, good as it possibly can. So we want to okay. keep as much Thanks. character to it as we can. And uh, thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Before we move on to the public comment. All right, I see none. Thank you. Can I make one more comment? Certainly. I didn't mention it during my. When I read this, but with this particular uh, proposal, they didn't they didn't have any additional signage or lighting or landscaping proposed. But uh, if that does get proposed, we could address it at the SIP. Certainly. All right. So we do have a public hearing, and so I at this time I'll request oh. any okay. additional Sorry. public comment. Is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on this agenda item? Any member of the public that wishes to address this agenda item? <coughs> okay, I'm seeing none, so I'm going to close the public hearing. Uh, we don't need a uh, an additional closing statement from the applicant, so commission, uh, the action is upon you. Motion to adopt the findings and recommendations as stated in the staff report. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any discussion on this motion? All right, I'm seeing none. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Belleville? Aye. Ms. Davey? Aye. Mr. Lowenstein? Aye. Mr. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Prop? Aye. Chairman Perry? Aye. 
Motion carried 6 -0. Thank you. Item number four is a general development plan and specific implementation plan for mixed use development on the east side of the 600 block of North Main Street and the west side of the 600 block of Jefferson Street. Uh, multiple parcels are listed. The City of Oshkosh Redevelopment Authority is the owner. The Corridor Development LLC is the applicant. Have there been any site inspections? Here as well. Okay, thank you. Those are so noted. I will accept the staff report as part of the record. Please present your summary. Thank you. Uh, so the site consists of uh, 12 vacant parcels on the west side of Jefferson Street and east side of North Main Street. Um, those parcels will be combined into one. Um, the neighboring land uses include commercial to the north and west, uh, commercial and residential to the south, and residential to the east. So here's a view of the uh, subject site, again currently vacant parcels. Uh, here's a site plan. Uh, the applicant is proposing a mixed use development with uh, a three-story mixed commercial residential building along uh, North Main Street. Um, and townhouses along Jefferson Street. Uh, the ground floor of the mixed-use building uh, will consist of commercial space to be used as a uh, daycare and the upper floors will have uh, 39 apartment units and the townhouses will have eight units per building. Uh, two neighborhood meetings were held uh, to show the neighbors the plans. Uh, neighbors in attendance voiced a uh, few concerns related to additional residents in the area, uh, buffering the development from the na neighboring properties and uh, building compatibility with the surrounding uh, prop uh, area. Uh, this also was brought to a plan commission workshop and uh, plan commission voice support for the proposal. Uh, the site will have driveway access off of uh, North Main Street and Jefferson Street and they're providing 50 parking spaces. They do need a BSM for their number of parking spaces as code requires 55 parking spaces. Um, staff is supportive of a BSM to allow the reduced parking as uh, site constraints limit the ability to provide those additional five stalls. Also there is on-street parking in the area to provide additional parking for the site and it has a uh, center city location which <coughs> offers alternative transportation modes to compensate for that, for that slight parking deficiency. Uh, they are also requesting a BSM to allow reduced uh, front yard setback along Jefferson Street to zero feet where code requires a 25 foot setback. Um, staff is also supportive of that BSM as there are those site constraints that limit the ability to meet that setback including um, the fire separation from the mixed use building and needing the uh, additional area to um, maximize their parking uh, layout. They're also requesting a BSM for reduced side yard setback along the north property line to four feet where code requires a five foot setback um, and uh, staff is supportive of that uh, reduction as they need to again maximize the parking area and also uh, shifting to the north gets, uh, <coughs> gets it out of the 10 foot by 10 foot vision triangle where that building would be along the entrance. Um, also requesting a BSM for uh, reduced side yard setback along the remaining uh, neighboring parcel um, to zero feet. Uh, however, staff is recommending increasing that to two feet by reducing the um, proposed parking lot uh, width for the two-way drive aisle from 26 feet to the code minimum of 24 feet. Um, so again, recommending a slight adjustment to provide a two-foot setback along that remaining property. Uh, code requires um, recreation area as it is a multifamily development um, uh, based on the square footage of the building and number of bedrooms. Um, they would need 3,400 square feet of recreation area and they are requesting a BSM to allow um, 1,650 <coughs> square feet of recreation area. Uh, staff is supportive of a BSM to allow that, again, as site constraints limit the ability to provide additional outdoor recreation areas. Um, the applicant notes that indoor community areas are available for occupants such as an indoor uh, exercise room, kitchenette and community room. And also, again, this is a center city area, um, which would commonly be zoned uh, central mixed use, which does exempt um, outdoor recreation area requirements. Here's the uh, landscape plan. Uh, they are meeting building foundation point requirements, um, also meeting paved area requirements. However, um, the uh, parking lot design does not meet the requirement um, of having the parking end rows be 125 square feet in area and uh, seven feet in width and also not providing the required uh, shade or tall deciduous tree in, in those islands. Um, staff does not have concerns with that BSM request as it is needed to provide circulation for the site. Um, also they are um, providing the required point, require, or point 
um, totals for tall trees and shrubs for paved areas. Um, they are meeting the street frontage point requirements along both street frontages. However, code also requires those street frontages to include 50% of the points being medium trees, um, and they are deficient of that along both uh, Jefferson Street and Main Street. Um, and staff is supportive of a BSM to allow that uh, point reduction for medium trees as they have reduced minimal setbacks along these frontages, which does not allow for um, them to meet that uh, medium tree point requirement. Uh, they are exceeding total yard landscaping points, uh, and that serves to offset some of these BSMs they're requesting. Um, there's a buffer yard requirement along the south property line as it is abutting residential zoning. Um, they are providing a 10 foot buffer yard along with about 24 feet of six foot tall solid fence. Um, and there's also neighboring fencing, um, I believe it's six foot tall solid fencing running along the neighboring residential property. Um, so rather than having um, the six foot fencing going all along the property line, they're only proposing where there's not neighboring fencing but increasing the uh, evergreen tree landscaping points. So they're about uh, four and a half times what would be required for evergreen tree landscaping points to meet that buffer yard. So uh, staff feels that that's an appropriate trade-off to have more evergreen trees rather than the back-to-back -back fencing along that property line. Um, for land, uh, site lighting, they are meeting the, um, the 0.4 foot candle minimum requirements along or for all parking areas. However, the drive areas are deficient of that 0.4 uh, foot candle requirement. Uh, staff is supportive of a BSM as they have minimal area to provide those uh, light fixtures along the property line without causing uh, increased excess lighting for the neighboring properties. So staff is supportive of that, that lighting reduction along the uh, drive entrances specifically. Here are the building elevations for the uh, townhomes. Um, so those are two-story buildings with the exterior consisting primarily of wood siding and the elevations are meeting all multifamily residential design standards. Here are the uh, building elevations for the mixed-use building. So code requires the front and side facades to be 50% class 1 materials. They are requesting a BSM for the west main street facing facade to be 44% uh, class 1 materials. Uh, staff does not have concerns with uh, that reduction is as it is a relatively slight reduction and um, they're exceeding the class one material requirements for the overall building facades. They're about 6% over the requirements. So here are the north and east elevations as well. Um, overall, the applicant is requesting BSMs for reduced parking spaces, setbacks, outdoor recreation area, lighting levels, class one materials, and specific landscaping requirements. And to offset those BSMs, uh, the applicant is providing 129% of the required landscaping points for the site and also exceeding the class one material requirements um, by about 6.4% for the mixed use building. And staff feels they have adequately offset those BSMs and the development will be compatible with the surrounding area. So with that, staff recommends approval of the GDP and SIP with the findings and conditions in the staff report. Thank you for your report. Plan Commission, oh, I'm, the plan director would like to have a word. Yeah, um, just, you know, a little note on, it does, uh, you know, appear to be a lot of base standard modifications. However, it's less than a block north of where our CMU, Central Mixed Use, cuts off. If this was a block farther south, many of these would no longer be required. Given the urban nature and the logical extension of the urban core, it makes sense for this to be an urban style development. So there is already building wall in that area and some of the surrounding properties uh, with that street wall. So it makes sense to develop it in that nature. And then when you combine that with the you know, need of housing in the community, I think it makes a lot of sense to be supportive of the project, even though there's a number of base standards you know, that are required for it. Thank you. Any technical questions? From the plan commission, Mr. Lonesy. I, I don't know if it's a technical question, but I was wondering on the Main Street side what the materials are um, that we're allowing to be used instead of Class One. Yeah, so we actually have samples as well, and when the architect comes up, he can go over exactly which ones. But we have samples we can pass around for you as well. As Brian noted, they're using Class Ones, but it's only at a ratio of forty-four percent instead of the 50 percent required but we can actually you know with their help tell you exactly which ones of the samples provided are going on that facade any other technical questions <coughs> okay
Okay, I'm seeing none. We will open a public comment period, and I will open that and request a statement from the applicant. Is the applicant here? Approach the uh, podium and state your name and address for the record, please. Greetings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Justin Mitchell, uh, 652 Monroe Street, Oshkosh, uh, about six blocks, actually exactly six blocks east of this site. Um, I appreciate uh, the, the overview. I think you did a good job, Ryan. Um, it was this project is was, was a fun one to work on in that we um, seldom lay out all of the community plans and then try and, and, and figure out exactly what they're looking for and assemble that exact product. And that's really what this was. So the RDA put together multiple years in a row a request for townhomes along Jefferson Street. Um, future land use plan calls for mixed use development. Um, other plans in the city talk about uh, tucking the parking behind the building so that it's not you know, a parking lot directly on, on Main Street as it, it is just north of our site. Um, so many different aspects from you know the housing needs assessment and um, the downtown action plan from I think 2001 went into formulating what this project was going to be and this is the result of those plans so um, congrats to the city but um, also should note joining me here uh, we've got uh, David Juno, uh, Janelle sorry, with Wire Capital he's part of the ownership and um, uh, development team um, and then we've got Josh Sommerfeld. He is an architect with M&A Design. Um, Sue Van Howlingen, uh Also, as you heard, there's the, the child care aspect to that. Sue is the chair of the board of the Oshkosh Child Development Center, which would be the nonprofit child care operator. And then uh, Jason Day with Excel Engineering. So um, happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. Thank you. Any questions from the plan commission at this point? Mr. Bellevue. Um, just in regard to, uh, to the, I guess, the outside material, is it primarily wood? And um, I'm just thinking about, you know, downtown, a majority of it is brick or stone. And, and then I guess uh, I want to know that the coloring, the coloring and the, the mock-up, that's the exact coloring that we'll get. Um, I'm just kind of wondering how we chose almost all wood and then um, how we got the, the coloring uh, for the building so, uh, would be my questions. Yes. Those are great questions. I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Um, address 24, if, I, if that works, uh, 24 South Brook Street, Fond du Lac for m and Yes, so uh, about the siding, how we ended on wood is actually originally I had fiber cement on here, but what I'm finding is fiber cement doesn't perform well in our climate. Um, so what we have is we've, we've got the class one, a lot of brick on there. The, that Almost all the black that you see is all the brick. Um, the main entry has a pillar of gray brick to accent it. And then the rest of the material that you see there is LP. So the white stuff that you see is LP. It's a wood product. It's a manufactured product. Uh, I propose a smooth panel with uh, a channel, a metal channel in between. It'll have like a little half inch reveal. It'll be a very contemporary, modern vibe. You probably won't even know that it's wood, to be honest. Um, and then in that sample there, there's two There's two fan decks. I've got little pieces of paper on those. Those are all the colors. So on the left side is the lap siding. That's <coughs> what you're gonna see on the townhomes. On the right side is the smooth siding. And that's what you're gonna see on the mid rise to give it that contemporary commercial vibe on the main street there yeah if I can add in what you see here that is called out in wood in the white we have traditionally seen in recent years developer using fiber cement board and, and as Josh mentioned what they're seeing is that product does not have the same longevity that some of the wood products do so they're starting to see wood products and you can probably talk about this too Ed mimic the look of some of the, it, we used to have a fiber cement board that mimicked wood, and now we've made a transition <coughs> now to some wood that mimics fiber cement. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's a product analysis kind of thing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Any additional questions before we move on? I'm not sure I fully understand which of these materials goes where. Yeah, I'd I like a better explanation. Yeah, maybe if yeah, you could you point mind. out what's what for yeah, us. Don't mind. All right. So this. Uh, here, we'll start here. So this color, this is the, the abyss black that 
there's a small section of it on the west and then the south elevation it's just on the corner up there it's kind of float yep right there that's abyss black this is going to be a smooth panel it's going to have the channels and the grooves so it'll look very commercial and then the white stuff is this right here it's snowscape white that again will be the smooth panel uh, very commercial look in between the windows there you have this which is called harvest honey it's kind of an orange color and that'll be like a it'll be a vertically grooved panel so every about eight inches you'll see a groove uh, for a little texture and then this material that i have here this is tundra gray this is on the townhomes only and that is to complement the gray brick color which would actually this is kind of deceiving this is a cmu sample um, unfortunately the bricks are made to order so i couldn't get a brick sample but this is the color that along this edge that will complement on the townhomes so i'm trying to repeat the the color scheme on both buildings but yet give a residential feel on jefferson street and a commercial feel on main street oh okay and then, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is the black brick. So, it's just the, this is primarily, th this is what's 56% of the, of the commercial building, of the three-story mid-rise building. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, at this time I'd like to open the public comment to any member of the public that wishes to speak on this agenda item. Are there members of the public that wish to speak on this agenda item? Any member of the public that wishes to speak on this agenda item? Okay, I'm seeing none, so I'm going to close the public comment period. We don't necessarily need a closing statement from the applicant unless you choose to make one. Okay, plan commission, the action is upon you. Motion to adopt the findings and recommendations as stated in the staff report. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Ms. Davey. I just want to say, wow. I like this very much. Thank you. Ms. Prop. I see Justin's fine hand in this, and I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Experience pays off. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comment on the motion? I do have one. As much as I um, detest all the BSMs and would love to make Mr. Mitchell jump to all of them, um, my need for such is far outweighed by the need for such a project to occur. And because it is a quality project, I guess I'll let him off a little bit this time and fully support this project. Any other comments? And I'm seeing none. Let's have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Velva? Aye. Ms. Davey? Aye. Mr. Lowenstein? Aye. Mr. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Croft? Aye. Chairman Perry? Uh, aye. Motion carried 6 0. Thank you. Item number five is the approval of the Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. So this is an update to the uh, corp that was uh, last adopted in 2018. Uh, so planning staff has worked with the uh, parks department and made suggestions on the uh, corp. Um, and the review is for consistency with the uh, comprehensive plan. And we do have a uh, slideshow uh, made by Rettler Corp and the uh, parks director. Rebecca Ramirez. I'm a landscape architect with Butler <laughs> Corporation. Um, just a second here. Uh, Rettler Corporation is a Stevens Point uh, based landscape architecture, civil engineering, uh, design and planning firm. Um, we also do construction management and we have um, survey department in house as well. Rutler Corporation has assisted the city with the preparation of the last two comprehensive outdoor recreation plans, and we are honored to be able to, to, to be doing that again. Um, 
while I go through this presentation, please feel free to um, let me know if you have questions while we're on the topic and Andrew up there. So, what is a comprehensive outdoor recreation plan? I'm not sure how many of you are involved or, or looked through um, the last process, but anyway. Um, it is, and I'm gonna call it a corp for the duration of this presentation, if that's all right, it'll save us a few minutes. <laughs> uh, it is a formal document designed to assist communities in planning and developing uh, the parks and open space. And good planning is essential to make sure things are done logically and efficiently. A corp establishes park-related goals and objectives. It upgrade, excuse me, updates demographic information about the city. It inventories existing park and recreation facilities. Then we analyze parkland and recreation needs using several metrics I will go through. Uh, custom, then we create customized recommendations by seeking and incorporating community input. Um, uh, integrate the recommendations into a capital improvement strategy in which all the, each project is described and given a priority and a, and a rough cost on that. We also identify a list of potential funding programs and grant opportunities. And uh, this uh, a municipality is eligible to apply for and receive state and federal grants once a plan is approved. And these must be updated every five years. So this is the um, table of contents or the general layout of this corp update. Um, we have section one, an introduction. Section two, community description. Section three, parkland inventory. Section four, parkland analysis. Section five is a needs assessment. That's where we look through the, um, the um, public input on that section. Uh, section six, recommendations. Section seven is implementation strategies. And section eight is references and of course an appendix. And then uh, we'll take a, a little bit of a closer look at these sections coming up here. So sections one and two is the introduction and community description. This goes uh, kind of summarizes past planning and accomplishments, goals and objectives, and uh, uh, kind of an overview, a summary of the planning process. Then the community description looks at demographics, uh, the environmental characteristics, like the soil type, flora, fauna, look a little bit at history, uh, location, and current land use. All right, we'll spend probably the longest in sections three and four. So parkland inventory. First thing we do is re-examine and look at um, the city parks are uh, classified based uh, basically on NRPA classifications. And uh, so we have mini parks, neighborhood parks, community parks, special use parks, waterfront recreation, natural resource areas and greenways. And um, this uh, document here, um, again, based on NRPA, which is National Recreation and Park Association, uh, it describes what each park basically uh, is or contains typically, um, its preferred size, and then the service area uh, size that will go with that. All right, uh, there's two maps up there. I don't know how well you can see them, but the book should have them larger. Um, this are the, excuse me, these are the park location maps. On your left, you will see a, an outdoor recreation area map. So that one kind of includes uh, roughly everything. It's got county parks, it's got schools, it's got the city parks. And then the map on the right is the city owned parkland. Uh, but we look at both just to get a comprehensive picture. We also include in this section a park matrix that allows a person to um, find an amenity pretty quickly or a category of amenities uh, running along the top. And then along the left hand, you will see the um, parks organized by category. Um, and these also tie in with the numbers on the map. Additionally, uh, each park is uh, given a sheet where you can look at it in more detail. We um, got pictures from site visits. We have the name, the classification, address, location, size, parcel number, uh, an amenity list, and uh, like I mentioned, pictures. So kind of in summary, going from inventory to analysis, we have 41 city-owned classified park sites. We have three mini parks, 15 neighborhood parks, five community parks, 10 waterfront parks, four special use parks, and for natural resource areas. And then as we head into the analysis to get a, a complete picture, because it's hard to look at things in different angles, <coughs> we uh, evaluated parkland um, from several different angles. So there's the uh, 
Acreage standards, that's a classic approach derived from the guidelines for the, for the development of local comprehensive outdoor recreation plans by, by the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, they, <coughs> those numbers ultimately descended from NRPA numbers, um, and those are uh, parkland acres per 1,000 persons. Uh, we have service area evaluation that looks at where the parks are located um, in re relation to the users. There's NRPA recreation standards. Um, those are included in the appendix. They no longer update that, but it's still worth a look anyway. Um, just another thing to, to evaluate. Then community input, uh, which is the most important metric, where people directly tell us what's working, what's not working, what's getting used. And then we also looked at the regional and state trends from the Wisconsin State Corp. They have their own statewide version. So we'll look at a couple of these a little closer. And this is that acreage standards comparison. So as you look across, <coughs> excuse me, as you look across, you'll see many parks, the recommendation, recommended acreage for 1,000 persons is point, like a quarter to half an acre. And uh, Oshkosh has 0 0.01, which is actually, I mean, while low is kind of typical nowadays as long as the rest of your numbers are good because what happens is you've got these little pocket parks or mini parks and you have to maintain them and move people around so I often see the, those numbers lower um, than that recommendation. Uh, neighborhood parks one to two acres um, Oshkosh has 0.95 so it's a little low. Uh, community parks five to eight acres uh, we have 3.95 per 1,000 people um, then we have special use parks, waterfront parks, and natural resource parks. Those don't have recommendations, but it is important to take those into consideration. So while the, um, that level of service classified parkland is 4.55 acres, which is a little lower than the 6.25 to 10.5 recommended, when you look at the total city-owned parks, we're at 6.22, which is right on the, the lower end. Um, but again, it's important to note that there's a large number of waterfront parks because of the natural resource situation of the city. Um, so as you can see, the overall the parkland's a little bit on the lower than the metric from the guidelines, the, the DNR um, guideline for development of local comprehensive park plans, which is something to be aware of, but it's not necessarily a bad thing, especially if your other metrics are showing um, the needs are being met. Um, it can help you qualify for grants. It is interesting, though, every year the NRPA agency um, publishes a nice little booklet where they do a study of all these different park areas and come up with averages. And when you look at persons per park, Oshkosh is much higher at 1,633 than the median at 2,240. So just another demographic to look at there. Um, However, when and if the opportunity to acquire additional parkland uh, arises, it's Excuse recommended. Me. I'm sorry, yes. Could you just repeat those, the last? Those oh, the last ones? one? Yeah. Um, so again, there's a number of different metrics um, when they do the survey, and when they look at number of people per park, Oshkosh is a much more favorable ratio than their average. So that means you have a lot of small parks? Is that, that would, that that would imply, suggest? yes. And probably a lot of those waterfront parks. So in the waterfront parks, it has such Doesn't a separate have, category. Yeah, right. So I'm just kind of going back here. But we do look at the big picture and the other metrics, which we'll take a little quick look at as well. So it's something to be aware of, but it's not, it's just what it is. <laughs> it's not like a, a disaster or anything like that, and people are pretty happy on the surveys. So, and then we will uh, reference the, uh, proposed park acquisition map where we'll look uh, at other uh, angles on this. So up here we have another metric. We've got the service radius. Uh, on the left hand side, okay, so back in the park classifications you have service radii recommended by NRPA. Um, on the left side you'll see the city is uh, kind of a tan color, the boundaries, and you'll see the parks, neighborhood parks, kind of the backbone, you'll see them in red, and then community parks are, you'll see two different um, sort of magenta colors because they have a range in the service area. Uh, on the right hand side, we took all of the residentially owned areas and highlighted them a little bit darker brown, turned off the city. And now you can start to see the service radius, you know, what's, what's not being covered, what is being covered a little bit better. 
So those are interesting and kind of looking at what's what's coming and being planned. And that data helped us come up with our potential parkland acquisition map. So those teal colored ones are potential neighborhood park locations and the, the purple lavender ones are potential community park locations in the future to look at either having, maybe there is land to develop or, or acquiring land if the opportunity arises. Um, we also looked at existing park master plans. There's some data there and some pictures from uh, master plans that are, are currently in the works or in the process still, they're being phased in. Uh, and again, the most important metric is uh, the community input. So we, uh, this online surveys were conducted by the city of Oshkosh utilizing Pol excuse me, Polko uh, March 4 through 31 of 2024. Um, that survey consisted of 20 questions. 483 people took that survey. That data from the survey is summarized in section five in the book there. And then also, if you want to see the actual survey results, data, you know, all the responses, those are found in the electronic version of the Comprehensive Park Plan. We didn't put it in the printed version. It would almost double it there. Uh, there was also some community input meetings. We did public uh, input meetings for Pickert Park Master Plan and Quarry Park on April 30th, and then also conducted a staff park staff input meeting on March 25th. How did you have, how did people know these surveys were happening? The, uh, the online ones? Um, or were they localized? No, what, well, the city did them, so I'll let Ray speak to that here. Ray Maurer, Parks Director. Um, the question was how did people know that the surveys were being um, online or available? Oh, oh actually. Yeah, we did um, social media posts, and when we make a post, we share it with all city departments, and they'll share it online. Um, we include that in city manager newsletters. Um, <laughs> trying to think what else we did. Polco, um, when you sign up for Polco, I believe you get an email directly if you've um, done the surveys in the past, so you should have got an email saying, here's a new survey being conducted by the city of Oshkosh as well. Can you speak to, is 483 yes. a decent number? Yes, that's pretty typical as we do these books. Um, it varies a little bit, but typically between one and three or 4% of a municipality's population will respond, and that was uh, well within that amount. Okay, and then the community input meetings? Those were on the Picker Park Master Plan and Quarry Park. Did so that was a local, like a geographic area that was invited to those? These are, yeah, these were for specific park plans we're currently working on. Um, Pickard Park Master Plan, we've been working on um, directly with that neighborhood. We actually have a neighborhood meeting next Wednesday mm -hmm. to um, show them design concepts for, again, input they gave us at their um, neighborhood meeting. Quarry Park was an initial meeting with the Quarry Park Neighborhood Association to get an idea what they'd like to see in the park now that um, the restroom shelter building has uh, been demolished and the parking lot that was dilapidated is gone. Um, so we had an initial meeting with them so that they can give us some initial feedback. Those were more sp um, specific for those parks, um, but we did have a number of public input opportunities at the Advisory Parks Board, which I think you're gonna have on one of the next slides. Parks Board. Um, okay, so that'll be in that'll be in an upcoming slide, but there was public input available as well as the Advisory Parks Board. I think there were three different meetings there. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thank you. All right. <coughs> All right. Section six is recommendations. Uh, in that section, we divided that into general recommendations. <coughs> excuse me. That are park wide. Those would deal with issues like ADA accessibility, um, park system planning, public-private partnerships, and, and plans like that, um, recommendations. And then there's park-specific recommendations is in the second half, and those are going through certain parks, probably quite a few parks, and um, making specific recommendations for improvements on those. Um, that section also has proposed park types and a, and a maintenance recommendation um, section there, too. All right, section seven is implementation strategies. So this one includes, and that's also there uh, in the book, uh, this ties in with specific recommendations. Um, this contains approximate costs and priority levels um, for these 
park improvements. Um, they're pretty high level estimates for planning purposes. You know, you looked at uh, bid numbers that we've gotten in and did some looks at those to get those. I mean, those projects should also be reviewed and some of the details ironed out. For example, a building, what, what you know, planning do you want to, how do you want to program it and stuff. So there'll be some things to figure out, but they're good for planning purposes. Um, and you would generate a, probably a more specific cost estimate before you present that to the city for approval, eventually. Uh, the city is also currently looking into impact fees and updating parkland dedication fee in lieu of parkland dedication ordinance as potential funding sources using the corp and other park plans as well. And then we have a, rec a references section with the bibliography and aerial views of every park as well, uh, numbered to match the map. All right. So this is the progress to date, and we're here we look at next steps. So October 10, 2023, we did the kickoff meeting. October 10 and 18 on 2023, we did park site visits with the parks director. Uh, March 4th through March 31 was the online community survey. February 12 was an advisory park board presentation. March 25 was the park staff input meeting. April 30 was the Pickard Park Master Plan community input and the Quarry Park listening session. May 1, draft 1 was submitted. May 13, August 12 were both advisory parks board presentations. Uh, and then we're here at September 17, plan commission presentation. Um, and the next step in the process pending approval here would be adoption by the Common Council. Are there questions or comments? Any plan commission, Mr. Lowenstein? So, I, I mean, it's more of a general question, but yes. today we just approved a plan to allow half the appropriate outdoor space for a big apartment complex downtown. How does a park planning from a public perspective does it take into effect that we are not requiring a private entity to give uh, given up park space? Do we do you keep track of things like that? So we have a space that says it should have 3,000 square feet, that's 1,500 square feet. Can we, do we do something on the public side to make sure those kids have enough public space within the radius? Yeah, so um, how do those things work together? Yeah, so, so kind of two elements there. The first, outdoor recreational space as required within the zoning ordinance is not intended to be a replacement for park space. It is intended to be outdoor green space that is usable by the residents of a specific development. It is only required <clears throat> in multifamily developments that are not in the urban core, because it is recognized that in the urban core, the value of land is more, you know, from a priority of buildings and improvement standpoints than parkland. Um, you'll also see if they can go back to the neighborhood map, there are needs for some increased park space in the urban core that, that is identified within the plan. Um, we also recognize within that plan and staff took a look at this that there is a number of opportunities for increased park space looking at the broader community not a specific element of a development. You'll also see and it was mentioned on I think the second to last slide parkland impact fees and updating our fee in lieu of and our parkland dedication requirements. I'm actually going to talk about more during the director's report where that is at. There is an ongoing study that is being done that was approved by council to look at how we improve the monetary side of parks from parkland impact fees to address our growing populations, how we uh, make sure we are receiving adequate land based on the sizes of developments. So those are actively being updated because we know their time and place that they need to be done. So is there a case, for example, instead of just defer or doing a BSM, doing the modification, we could say, in lieu of the space, we would like you to fund the park department in some way so that the, there's public space to make up for the lack of private space so, for those residents? Um, no. How do we coordinate? The, the, the answer for, to that specific question is no. You cannot... You cannot condition a land use approval on something of that nature. You can use it as consideration when looking at a development. Is there parkland in the, available in the area to offset the ask? But you could never tie approval of a land use decision. You need to look at it for the merits of what it is based on the development being proposed. You could not say, I'm only going to approve this if you then give money to the Parks Department. That is fee in lieu of, which is a separate element of the ordinance where the ordinance requires it. Part of what we're doing 
with the par- Parkland Impact Fee Study is looking at how we level the playing field for fee in lieu of versus Parkland dedication. Right now, the way the code reads is if you need to create a plat for your development, you have to do f- Parkland dedication or fee in lieu of. If you have a standalone single parcel that you are taking ownership and development of, you are not required to do Parkland dedication or fee in lieu of. That does create some inadequacies in the way that the current plan works. You could build 500 units on a parcel that needs no CSM, and you have to do nothing to assist with the parkland needs of the city. You could build that same development and need a CSM, and now you have to do fee and lieu of or parkland dedication. Not really. Those same 500 units have the same impact on the city and its needs either way. That's why we're doing that study to get those things brought up to speed. Okay. All right, are there any other questions? So the, um, yes, Ms. Prop. I, I just have a comment. This is incredibly detailed. Oh. <laughs> and I appreciate all the Google photos and other photos. You know, it helps. A lot of it, helps, it helps to uh, understand what is here. And I just want to make the comment that you mentioned it. Oshkosh is still deficient in park area. And this is a soapbox I've been on for quite some time. <laughs> um, and that's why the, the study about how the heck can we beef up funding of park acquisition and then park development, both. Mm-hmm. And then because you I, maintain, parks have yeah, been, I think, underfunded by this community for a long time, in my opinion. Uh, so anyway, there it's a very it's a very good report and I thank you. Well thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Ray, you got anything you want to add? Just uh, just real quickly and Rebecca touched on it, but if you can go back to the slide that shows all the other park master plans that we have. Um, as you're looking through this document, you're going to notice that um, these these are ma- the majority of these are community parks, and due to the size of them, we have individual park master plans for most of those parks. So even though um, I don't have the specific number, but it's about seven million dollars of improvements in this document. Don't forget about the uh, Menominee Park, 19 million, um, Lakeshore Park, 13 million, and a lot of those costs are outdated based on when. Um, the plans were adopted so yes this is for a lot of the mini and neighborhood park improvements and so forth Uh, but what we do in our department is we continually look at all the master plans we have as we start doing our capital improvement um, planning and and budgeting Uh, but I want to just make sure that everybody's aware there is a large cost to the the park development that we are still looking at in the city in the existing parks thank you so the item is approval of the comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. So that means we would need a motion for approval. Well, go ahead. Uh, I'll I'll approve the comprehension comprehensive outdoor <laughs> recreation plan. Okay, we have a motion for approval of the outdoor comprehensive comprehensive outdoor recreation plan second and we have a second Do we have any discussion on the motion miss prop I promised Ray that I would ask him some questions so I would like to ask him. <laughs> well, Ray relevant to parks but not particularly to this but it's my excuse to do it and first of all I want to thank you and the parks board again for paving the loops in Lakeshore Park on the trail. Uh, I harped on that for a little while and it's just, it's wonderful to have those loops around the edge so that one can go as far or as short as you want to go in Lakeshore Park, what we have left of it. And I appreciate that very much. And I use it. And uh, the next thing I noted was that I was on the Riverwalk and you you have new, somebody has new wayfinding. 
signs along the river walk. You know, here's, uh, where's the uh, convention center? Where's this park? Where's that park? Where's the bathrooms? Well, um, I alleged, and I still allege, that in the center of these two long north and south river walks, we have one public restroom, Boat Works. And, but if you go all way, way, way north up to the Four Seasons building, then that's a public restroom open in the, the nice season. And if you go all the way down to the other end, um, evidently there are outdoor restrooms at the convention center, which I did not know, and I'm going to go look for them. I know where the, I think I know where it is on the court, by, right by the, it's on the main right street across side. from the hotel. Correct. Um, and I see that inside, but I never see it outside. Um, and the leech when it's open. Beyond that, those are the, it's a long way between restrooms if you are walking. Um, so I think the signs make it seem like, oh, there's going to be a restroom just in another you know, block or two. Well, they're not that close. And so I th I'm making the suggestion that while those are great wayfinding signs, and I don't complain that maybe there should be some specifics like on a sign. Like three point two miles to the next bathroom. Yeah. yeah, or you know, or whatever. You know, I don't know. A small P.S. You know, this is where they're located, sort of thing. So no. And thank you for listening to me, and thank you for producing this report. No thank you. And just I'll touch on the signage yep. real quickly because it is a project that um, has been on our docket along with planning staff we've been working on this for probably five years I think mm -hmm. and so it, it is great to have the, uh, the signs out there because they've been requested by visitors yeah. and the Convention Visitors Bureau right. and the businesses and you know when we take a look at um, that is I'll admit it's a distance to travel but um, we do have restrooms on both sides of the river at both ends of the the river walk basically um, but as you look at trails throughout whether it's in Oshkosh or anywhere else trails generate economic development and if we can help out a business by trail users going in and using their restroom and purchasing a beverage or purchasing some food or a product, um, we do we do hope that's what's happening on the trails as well. Um, so I hear you. It'd be nice to have more of them, more public restrooms. Um, but I think just based on some of the businesses along maybe, the way. Uh, a note on the signage. And that's something Mark and I talked about. Maybe we can take a look at yep. something as well. Yeah, those signs are recent. We can improve them. But, but thank you for having the signs. The signs are good. So thank you, Rick. Sure. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion on the motion? Any other discussion on the motion? Okay, I'm seeing none, so let's have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Belleville? Aye. Ms. Davey? Aye. Mr. Lowenstein? Aye. Ms. Proud? Aye. Chairman Perry. Aye. Motion carried 5-0. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, next item on the agenda is the planning manager's report. There yeah, are three items. A couple of things for you this evening quickly. Uh, just meeting reminder. Um, the uh, first October meeting, October 1st, was canceled due to no items uh, being submitted for that agenda. So there will only be one meeting in October, and it will be October 15th. So you get a little break. We won't see you for a month. Uh, similarly, in November, there is only one meeting. The first meeting fell on election day, and um, due to the election cycle and, and the rooms needed to accommodate that process, this room is unavailable, so there will be no first November meeting. There will only be a meeting in November on the 19th. S finally, in December, there is no second December Plan Commission meeting. There is only the first, which would be December 3rd. There is no December 17th meeting for Plan Commission because the council meeting would be December 24th, and I don't think anyone wants to go to council on December 24th. So with council being uh, not held, we only have the one Plan Commission meeting in December, and then we pick up business back in January. So the next three months, you only have one meeting to attend. Well, what about that joint? That's next on the list. Okay. <laughs> Celebrate this first. Yeah. I'm canceling. We're canceling meetings, and then I, you give you another one. 
on December 11th, we are going to be holding a joint meeting between the Parks Advisory Board and Plan Commission. That is going to be... Is that December oh, I, or November? November 11th. Did I say December? Okay. Excuse mm -hmm. me. November 11th between Parks Advisory Board and Plan Commission um, to talk about the impact fee study. Ellers is currently working on that study for the Parkland impact fees, the fee in lieu of the land dedication. Um, so we want to have a joint meeting between a lot of the boards that are involved in it. It'll be held over at the convention center. We'll get you more information as we get a little closer to that. But we want that opportunity to kind of talk, talk with both boards that are going to be impacted by that study before it moves on to council. We're also going to take it to Long Range Finance, get some input from them. Um, but kind of as we just talked, it's great that the corp is here tonight so we can kind of talk about the city has recognized that there's some deficiencies in how we develop parks and how we fund the development of parks. So making sure our metrics are brought up to speed with where we should be with peer communities. Um, a lot more information will be given at that. Prior to that, actually on October 30th, we're gonna be holding a public informational session on that same study. So that'll be October 30th, again, over at the convention center. We wanted to get that public input from the community before we have the board and commission meetings as well. So like I said, I'm canceling one for you in November, but I, we are going to ask that you attend a second one if you're available, just so we can get that out there you know, at one time instead of going to all the boards individually. Any questions on that? Because it does kind of tie into what we talked about with Corp tonight. None? All right. Finally, uh, this will be my last meeting with you. Um, I have accepted a position moving on from the city. Uh, so I've been here a little over seven years. Really appreciated all your time and effort you've put into being on this board. Um, I think Plan Commission is, is really one of the most important elements of the city. So I just want to thank everybody for their time. Um, leaving it in great hands with staff. I think as you all know, they do a great job with these. Um, so there'll be some changes as, as that position is refilled. But this will be my last time seeing you. Can you tell us where you're going? I'm going to a company by the name of Foth. It is a civil engineering uh, firm. They do consulting similar to what we do here for the city. Um, so I have a similar role with them, working with uh, smaller villages and towns, helping with their planning activities. Well, I'm just going to miss you, Mark. Thank you. And congrats on that. That's exciting. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to miss you, too. Thank you. That's it. All right. If there are no other questions. Last on the, on the agenda is adjournment. Move to adjourn. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. Uh, we can have a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? We are adjourned. Yeah.